All right, good afternoon. I'm Lisa Shea. I teach electrical engineering at West Point, and I'm here with my colleague Greg Conti, who teaches computer science at West Point, and our friend Woody Hartzog, who's a lawyer. He teaches, uh, he's an assistant professor at the Cumberland School of Law, which is part of Samford University. He's also an affiliate scholar at the uh, Stanford Center for Internet and Society, and he's worked at the Electric Privacy Info Center as well. So we're going to talk about confronting automated law enforcement, which is any use of automation, um, computer, computer analysis within the law enforcement process. Um, these are our own ideas, our own thoughts, not those of our employers. So the whole idea is we like living in a free society, and we don't want to live in a police state. And you think about it's, it's always good to obey the law. I mean, that's, that's part of our value system. That's part of what makes society work. But think about what happens if everyone obeys every law rigidly all the time. This is a, a video that maybe many of you have seen where a group of students at Georgia Tech tried an experiment. They drove around the beltway around Atlanta at exactly the speed limit, and they got a whole bunch of friends together and drove right across the entire highway at exactly the speed limit. And you can see the god-awful traffic jam that's building up behind them. And they were happy too. Yeah. yeah. And, and the people behind them, you can imagine, were, were just thrilled to be going exactly the speed limit. Uh, it, could, it actually could have been a very dangerous experiment. I mean, there were people <laughs> driving on the side of the road to try and get around this. What uh, the IRB say? <laughs> <laughs> so, so as I said, automated law enforcement is any computer-based system uh, that's going to use input from unattended sensors you know, that we have all around us um, to algorithmically determine whether or not a law has been broken and then to take some kind of action. So really what we want you to take away from this talk are, th are three things. One, the network technologies exist right now. Second, if we aren't careful in paying attention to how these systems are in place, really disastrous consequences could ensue. We could end up living in that police state we showed earlier. Uh, and then third, you all in this audience are in a unique position to help prevent this. You have the technical knowledge, you have the networks, you've got the, the skills and abilities to see what's going on and to ask the right questions of people who are trying to implement these systems. Uh, so, over to you, Greg. So what leads us to this conclusion? Well, we argue the precursors are in place for this now and it's a natural extension. We can see what's going on now and look into the very near future to see you know, where it's all heading and hence the motivation for our talk to try and generate some interest in, in deflecting the trajectory of this. <clears throat> so, just imagine the sensors in your home, the sensors in your, on your body, the sensors in your body, the sensors in your car, the sensors in your community. They're proliferating at a, at a massive rate and that creates uh, data and data flows at, at an enormous amount, increasing um, views on our lives from every, you know, every angle that can be sampled by a sensor. And we're seeing increased diversity and sensitivity of sensors. This is an example of someone who had a, uh, a medical test that injected a radioactive uh, compound into the body for a medical reason, driving home, sets off a radio, uh, a radio uh, activity sensor uh, in, in, a, in a police car and gets pulled over. And this is, you know, this is actually true. We have the links in the slide. But that's the type of thing. So we're seeing increased diversity of sensors. We're seeing sensors becoming mandatory. Uh, as in the United States, this trend toward mandatory black boxes in cars to track. We see increased mobility of sensors. Uh, we and, and alongside that, we see say, the t transfer of military technology, such as drones, into law enforcement roles. 
probably one of the largest uh, areas of concern is the, is the mobile device that we carry on our pocket and this closes our location. It includes, um, re it's replete with sensors and high speed network connectivity. So what I'm trying to paint here is a, por uh, is a portrait of where, where we are now. All these, all these precursors are in place that are beginning, you know, if you put them all, if you examine them individually, okay, maybe you don't see so much, but if you put them all together, something larger and more concerning emerges. You know, the idea of connected cars in OnStar, sometimes you can't get the car, particularly in a rental, without it. Discloses your location and this full-time connection. If they can start your car remotely, presumably they can turn it off remotely as well. We're losing control of our technology, and there's a great quote here from Cory Doctorow. But the idea is more and more we're having closed source technologies where it's illegal to lift the lid and look inside the firmware or the software. And so general purpose computing is, is under, under attack, and Cory has a great talk on that. Highly recommended. So we've got these data flows, and we have, uh, but once you have this data, well, what's a key component? It's identifying the people that are potentially the subjects of this law enforcement system. Uh, obviously, there's current advances in facial recognition system. And alongside mandatory uh, biometric databases uh, at the nation state level being uh, constructed, such as uh, in India, where there's over a billion people being enrolled in such a system. Computing, I mean, I think we all admit that uh, facial recognition isn't there yet. It has, it has its flaws, but hybrid systems are emerging to allow identification of individuals. And this is uh, from identifyrioters.com. And it's a great time to be alive when there's a website called identifyrioters.com. <laughs> But uh, this is from the Vancouver riots where they are trying to solicit crowdsourced identification of people who were allegedly involved in the riots. There's even business models where, com like say, convenience store camera monitoring is being crowdsourced and then they give small rewards to the citizens. So when, what can't be automated can be combined in a human-machine hybrid system. And then as we look to the future, has anyone seen uh, Google's Project Glass video? Uh, even better, have you seen the, uh, seen the parodies where they're wearing the glasses and, and they get a text message as they're crossing the street and get run over in the crosswalk? <laughs> you should definitely go to, go to YouTube and look up the parodies. They're better than the original. But the bottom line is, if this actually comes to pass, there'll be millions of people wearing always-on sensors, showing, looking around in every, every facet of your life or life on, uh, on the street being collected. And it's a matter of then getting access to that data by corporate America or uh, law enforcement. We also see a trend of analog systems uh, being converted to digital systems. And analog systems and law en analog, you know, traditional law enforcement is moderated by the human, in it's human in the loop intensive nature. But as things become increasingly efficient, then you can have automated or law enforcement with unprecedented rigor. And bonus points, what is this license plate from? Ah, Back to the Future 2, yes. That's why I love DEF CON, because you know people, <laughs> you, know, you know someone will come up with it. We're seeing increased uh, uh, capability to analyze these data flows. Here's a, here's a system that's cap that claims to be capable of tracking 32 vehicles across four lanes. And what, what we see emerging is on all major highways, the ability to track every car in real time, identify the car, identify its speed, and other activity. We also see other, um, other sensors technologies being, uh, being developed, such as the Wide Area Motion Imagery System, which can track individual vehicles and people over long term, you know, over course of hours, you know, long, long, long term monitoring of paths that individual uh, objects, people, and cars are taking. And the uh, very aptly named Persistent Stare Exploitation and Analysis System and then, of course, the cost of technology is dropping. Uh, location tracking, for, you know, for, so you can track your spouse or children, is, is dropping uh, on a daily basis. So the, the technology is getting cheaper and cheaper where it's almost disposable. And predictive policing, the ability to take the data as it exists today, uh, that you have now and then try and project out into the future when and where crimes will occur is actual re as actually reality. 
I mean, we've seen this before. Where have you seen it? Yes. So, uh, okay, these aren't pre, we're not saying there are precogs involved, but the, uh, the, it's, it's definitely out there, and, and there's, we have links in our, blog, uh, in, our, in our slide deck about where it's actually being done. And of course, there's lots of interested parties because a lot of this comes down to who is incentivized to employ these systems, who is incentivized to constrain these systems, and there's lots of interest across the law enforcement spectrum and from industry because this, you know, there's benefits to this and there's certainly dangers and there's certainly financial advantage. And uh, for those of you that live in New York, New York City, uh, and we live an hour north of New York, so we're apparently in the near future we'll be no longer able to purchase uh, 32 ounce sodas. And that just gives a trend toward there are well-intentioned officials that might like the idea of uh, broadly employ, uh, um, enforcing the law across the populace. And there are other, um, you know, historically if you look back, there are certainly uh, law enforcement agencies that have uh, strict, well, shall we say, strict enforcement models. Uh, some would call them speed traps, such that the Automobile Association of America has erected billboards outside some of these towns to warn motorists. So there, are, there is clearly the opportunity for abuse by automating some of these. And the, you hear the, the term quotas, and most people, law enforcement officials will say, well, quotas don't exist. We never tell our officers to, uh, to enforce a quota system and capture, uh, to um, you know, up the numbers for a given month. Well, we're, we argue that they do, and I mean, I'm sure they're not supported officially, but it's, here's an example that the New York City Police Benevolence Association has an actually a report form uh, to report when the officer claims that they've been asked to enforce a quota. So these are all like trends pushing this forward. And the, if you, who's seen bait cars, right? They leave a car on the side of the street and, uh, and someone decides to get in and the keys happen to be in the car and they drive off and they get locked in the car a few blocks away and arrested. Uh, so, but, so the idea of uh, these systems can be interacted and used in many, many innovative ways. Um, and as we look to the future, you know, who knows what type of bait, uh, the bait could be used, um, you know, the pleasure model robots or who, not, who, who knows what. And then out and out illegal enforcement. Well, you know, we don't want that to happen. Out, it, it, the, the power that these systems provide allows for illegal in, enforcement and potentially. And we can certainly, and I want a, car, a picture like that on top of my car, just for the record. <laughs> But clearly, certain regime, regimes will abuse these systems on, if, if, they, if they have the power to do so. And this is all in the context of citizens who want a free lunch. And this is from Sands Fire, where uh, a bunch of security professionals were literally offered a, a free lunch uh, in, return for their, um, in, in, turn for, in return for their personal information. And, Similarly, social media is part of this, with disclosing so much information in largely a public way, and it has, has not gone unnoticed by uh, law enforcement entities. And here's an example of college students who knew their local uh, college police were monitoring, law, uh, monitoring Facebook and decided for underage drinking, and decided to stage a party uh, that they bragged about, and it turned out it was just cake and soda, uh, but when local law enforcement arrived, they were not pleased. Uh, but still, the idea here is that social media provides a data flow. <laughs> and this isn't all pie in the sky, just this is going to happen. We already see successful prototypes and business plans now. Uh, and if any of you, for example, have driven the, the I-95 between, say, the Washington, D.C. area north toward New York City, there's sections of the highway that, are, that have, have cameras at regular intervals. So we're not making this up. And then the law itself lags technology. And it's progressing forward at such a rate that the law just isn't there yet, and will probably never be there. So where is all this heading? Okay, we've got enabling technologies, check. Sensors everywhere, check. 
Promiscuous data sharing by citizens, check. Security and financial incentives and well-intentioned law enforcement and complacent citizenry, check and check. And then the law lagging technology and successful prototypes. So the, all the precursors are in place and we have to now look at where this is all going and make sure that we deflect it in, onto a trajectory that makes, that makes sense because otherwise, frankly, I don't think this is going to end all that well. Jesus. That's what you get for having someone else's keyboard. Okay, good. So how does the law become involved in all of this. So Greg just talked about how the technology is in place. The sensors are there to record our activities, but that's not the only thing that can be automated. Um, when we're talking about automated law enforcement, we're, we're talking about a complete loop, not just with sensors and recording activity, but then storing that activity, processing that activity, and making a decision whether to punish someone or not based on that activity. And so we've actually got three different levels here where we talk about uh, there's the subject that is surveilled, the law enforcement agency at various points which you could automate decisions, and finally the judicial system, do we decide to mete out some kind of punishment or not? And I'm going to turn it over to Lisa to talk a little more about this diagram. Okay, granted, this is a busy slide. It's in the um, CD that you got, so you can look at it in more detail later. Um, but briefly, I'm going to go over the, the areas of how this could be automated. So looking at the upper left corner of the diagram, subjects going about his or her daily life being surveilled by an automated system, which a la minority report might have a predictive module in it that then says, ooh, subject is about to commit a crime. And depending on the scenario, could potentially stop that crime, prevent that crime, a la minority report. Or in an another scenario, could warn the suspect that, hey, you're, what you're about to do is illegal. And then the suspect has to make a decision to commit the crime, or not. And then if the crime is in fact committed, there will be some post-processing again by the surveillance system that then decides, ooh, did the system detect that a crime was committed or not? Yeah, somebody committed one, but does the system catch it? Uh, if the system doesn't catch it, that's a false negative. There, an error has occurred, but in our personal view, a, a system that doesn't catch a crime is, you know, it, it's, it's got problems, but that's not the most serious kind of error. Uh, what's worse is if the person says, oh, you're right, I'm not going to commit this crime, then the post-processing algorithm decides that they did anyway, that's a much more serious error. We call that a false positive, and that's, that's where some of the real danger lies. Um, and then if the crime was detected, the law enforcement system then decides to prosecute or not. In a normal, everyday, human-based system, the police officer on the beat has discretion. But in an automated system, this becomes embedded in code, and code, does this, code is a deterministic process. It will do the same thing every time, and there's not going to be the opportunity for discretion. The system then, if it decides to prosecute, hopefully will notify the person that they've been prosecuted. Again, one of the things we're looking for if some sort of system is implemented is transparency and notification so that uh, you're not automatically punished without even knowing what you did wrong. Then if the suspect is notified, that suspect then has the choice of to uh, contest it or not. And, and then in the judicial process, if they contest, then they can either be acquitted or not. So this whole system sets up a feedback loop and in a normal life situation that we have now, that's a fairly slow loop. And there's time for reflection. There's time for, for um, consideration of all the facts. In an automated system, we fear that that loop gets so fast that, that the, the person is punished before they even realize what's been done to them. There's lots of opportunities for automating the punishment side of things. Uh, the top row, and again, this is a small slide, but it's in your CD, uh, the top row shows things that are currently in place. The bottom row shows technologies that could be in place in a couple of years. The middle row shows what could be done now with technology if there was a will. And the range of punishments run the gamut from just notice to, 
to execution. And we'll go through a couple examples. So in Virginia and in many other places, there are websites that show you where cameras and systems are in place. Um, there are also places that will send you notice or emails of uh, s uh, warning systems that are implemented. Um, and then I think we've all been driving and seen one of these uh, radar systems. And you can, it's, it's an automatic feedback system. You can see how fast the police think you're going. You can see what the speed limit is. And then you can make a decision. Now, a la Grand Theft Auto, I don't recommend trying to make that delta as large as possible. <laughs> yeah, if you hit 99, extra points. Uh, if any of you saw Bruce Schneier's talk yesterday at Black Hat, he talked about one of the, one of the mechanisms that help a law-abiding society stay functional is that people are concerned about their reputations. And we all want to protect our good reputations. <coughs> and what some law enforcement agencies are starting to do is put on websites pictures of people who have committed a variety of different crimes. And you can imagine how easy it is to just take a police blotter and, and write some, some very simple scripts that put all that information up on a website daily. Um, in a more um, uh, detrimental way, there are automatic systems for providing citations, points, fines. Um, I know lots of people who've gotten uh, automatic tickets based on red light cameras or speed traps or things like that. And then finally, or well, next to finally, uh, there are systems that could, could arrest people. Uh, the bait cars are one example, or uh, robotic systems with a variety of, of mechanisms on them. Um, we can automate the prosecution process as well. Here's an example of some source code from a uh, open source uh, camera security project that can, again, it's just, it's code that makes a decision as to whether or not a crime's been committed. Um, we have systems in place already for confinement. Uh, there's a whole variety of GPS tracking devices. Greg showed a couple examples. Uh, your, your cell phones are GPS tracking devices as well. And there's a business model for, for outsourcing this type of uh, enforcement of, of certain types of punishments. You know, and, you know, for those of you who are interested, it, you know, the website says GPS is now available for only $3 per day. So run out and get yours. Um, track your family members for only three dollars a day. Yeah, well, you know, I can think of my children would be a, a good use for this. Too. Um, and then finally, you know, the ultimate punishment is death. And there are already um, examples of automated systems that have lethal weapons attached. Uh, the ones that we know about right now, by and large, have humans in the loop, um, and that's, you know, but but that technology doesn't necessarily require humans in the loop. Um, all right. So clearly there are advantages to this, and the, but there are certainly disadvantages as well. And, and it really depends on your perspective. Are you the subject? Are you the law enforcement agency? Or are you the judicial system? So we're going to roll through some examples. Some would argue that these systems provide a more secure society and a safer society. They clearly have the potential, or in theory, to offer increased efficiency. And for some, there'll be financial incentives. And really what underlies this, I believe, is incentives. Who's motivated to employ these systems? They have the potential to reduce bias. And depending on where you're coming from, that may be a good thing. Uh, for example, you may, there's some great research, literally called Driving While Black, that shows a bias uh, of police officers. There's also uh, stop and frisk activities uh, in certain parts of the country. There's an uh, ongoing debate between crack and cocaine, uh, as, and, and the, uh, the punishments associated with possessions of each, which are really very similar substances. There can be protection from abuse, um, or these systems can be abused. So it depends on your perspective. 
So clearly, in, if, if you go back and look at the history of various countries around the world, uh, none are without their blemishes. And certainly there are false positives. If any of you have seen uh, Ed, ED-209 ED from, uh, from the movies uh, where um, in RoboCop, uh, they're demonstrating the robot, uh, hold, point your gun at, at, the, at the Ed-209 and uh, put down your, in the response, please put down your weapon. He puts down the weapon, the robot responds, you have 15 seconds to put down your weapon. And uh, after time runs out, I'm now authorized to use physical force. Things don't end so well. And there are also false negatives, and this is a classic example from Google Street View. Now this individual just could be doing exercise or have lost his keys, uh, but uh, these systems could see, uh, could, a crime could be occurring and could miss it. We argue that's probably better than a false positive in most cases. A key component is the identification of the people in the pictures. Well, historically, we have, uh, we've had issues with, uh, with uh, improper identification or incorrect identification. Classic example is Senator uh, Ted Kennedy appearing on it, uh, getting held up at the airport for being on a terrorist watch list. The results of this could be a, a less compliant populace because we as citizens have to agree. It's a contract. We have to agree to support the law, to believe in the law on some level. And if you take that decision making out of people's hands, there can be problems. And there's always the risk of unproportional response, uh, that the system will respond in a way that's inappropriate. And this is a Texas speed trap a motivational poster, a chain gun. And clearly this has the ability to enforce social, social, social control on a large scale, uh, particularly as we move forward. And really depends on whether your local politicians want you to have 32 ounce sodas or not, or a variety of other activities, they can enforce it with automated means. Some won't like the loss of power. Yes, and that's Batman. Uh, and it turns out Batman was pulled over uh, for incorrect plates, but he was actually going to a children's hospital uh, for his, and his plates were expired, so they let him go. But it was a good picture, so I thought it, I'd include it. Uh, but law enforcement and, and others, and you know, I would assume some in power, like the uh, professional courtesy, perhaps, ex uh, that the current law enforcement system provides to them. Well, they might not enjoy that loss of power if you have an unbiased law automated law enforcement system. And there's a, a nice example of Montgomery County uh, Police Department uh, in Maryland uh, photogra photographed speeding past the camera with their extended middle finger. The, uh, the unions and other police related organizations will certainly have something to say because efficiency could very well mean lost jobs. Okay, so there, there are many questions necessary to move forward, uh, you know, as we move forward in this era, I'll be followed by Woody. So what can we do? Chances are that we're not going to see full automation overnight. It's going to happen piece by piece. It's going to automate a little bit on the surveillance side and maybe a little bit on the decision-making decision side. And we think that the appropriate response is to start asking questions now to start demanding answers and that we, if a system is going to be implemented, that be implemented responsibly. And there are some things that need to be attended to if that's going to happen. So for example, the method of implementation, uh, are, uh, are they going to use the sensors that we're carrying around on our bodies or are they going to mandate that everyone install a, 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 a government brand sensor? Control. Who gets control over the enforcement system? Is it going to be low-level administrators? Is it going to be third parties, perhaps software vendors that create the code? Um, and if so, uh, what kind of influence are they going to have over the decision-making process? Because ultimately, if they're the ones writing the code, they are the final stop and they're interpreting law, um, and there are some potential problems with that. Legal integration of algorithms. Are we going to reach a point uh, where there is going to be incredible incentive to personalize the law. So for example, if I'm a very good driver, I can perhaps drive 10 miles an hour over the speed limit because I've been proven to be trustworthy, whereas someone who has a horrible driving record perhaps only gets about five miles an hour. Um, and they're able to uh, integrate uh, all kinds of algorithms that would be able to determine that. Do you stop the 
violation before it happens or do you wait until after it happens and then give a fine? Now that may seem like a simple question, but I think that the political pressure could be great when these systems are already implemented and entrenched for someone to say, well, if you can stop the crime, if you can stop the violation of the law, why wouldn't you stop the violation of the law? Um, but I think that there are significant problems with preemptive enforcement of the law. System error and malfunction. How much error are we willing to tolerate in a system? So, because of course no system is without error, we've got to make the decision, well, if it's only got a 5% error rate, then that's good, or 10% or 15%, and we need to determine who makes that call. Um, and some of the big questions, and I think the one that goes to the heart of our talk today, is whether we want perfect enforcement of the law. And I would like to go ahead and say now that we need to dispel this notion that the goals of law should be to achieve perfect enforcement. I think that to be effective, laws need only be enforced to the extent that violations are kept to a socially acceptable level. We don't enforce jaywalking 100%. We maybe enforce it 0.1% of the time, and we're okay with that. <laughs> uh, you know, we know that it's a rule, and as long as everyone more or less keeps it together, we're fine with that. Um, and so the goal shouldn't be perfect enforcement, and that's one thing that we'd like to, to make clear in this talk. Besides, another question about perfect enforcement is many times, for example, particularly with minor violations, we might violate the law seven to ten different times. So, for example, if you're speeding, and the speed limit is 55, you may go 57 and then drop back down to 53 and then go 60, all on the same trip. And so if you violate the speeding limit 17 different times in one trip, do you get 17 tickets or do you get one ticket? And these are difficult decisions that have to be made, particularly if the goal is to perfectly enforce the law. Woody, I'd, I'd add that we sometimes, I mean, it's just, a, we will violate the law. We could try scrupulously to not violate the law, but it's certainly just a function of minutes, perhaps an hour, you'll make, you'll make an infraction, you'll do something wrong. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, we're all violators. Yeah. But, I mean, even with the best intentions. Absolutely. Another problem uh, that comes with automated enforcement is the loss of human discretion. So while Greg talked about the fact that discretion can be bad because it can lead to unjust results. Discretion can be also very good. It allows us to be compassionate. It allows us to follow the spirit of the law instead of the letter of the law. And it allows law enforcement officers to prioritize enforcement. So I'm not going to investigate the case of the lost sneakers real hard because we've got some murder over here. And so we prioritize where we want to spend all of our energies. And when you take discretion out of it, I think that there are some significant problems. Uh, it also leads to the phenomenon known as automation bias. So there's a fair amount of research out there that shows that we as humans, as a group, tend to irrationally trust judgments made by computers, <laughs> even when we have reasons to potentially doubt that. Um, you know, the idea is, well, that doesn't look like the guy, but the computer says that's the guy, so that's probably the guy. And there's a, a, a fair amount of that uh, in the literature, and if you're going to automate a system, you've got to find a way to, co to combat automation bias. It's one thing to exercise your opinion and your right to freedom of expression, and it's another thing to do it when there's a government camera right in your face. And with the ubiquity of sensors and surveillance around, I fear that there will be uh, some serious chilling effects to the freedom of expression in the United States. And that's precisely what the First Amendment was created against. And I think that any automated system should take measures to make sure that there are no undue chilling effects on speech um, and our First Amendment rights. Also, imagine if, let's say, the use of speeding violations increases 700% when you automate the system, we all decided to appeal simultaneously. We would crash the system. Um, you have to make sure before you implement any system that there's a, a mechanism that the infrastructure can handle uh, both the burden of the initial violations being issued and the appeals process that comes after it. And finally, there's the issue of societal harm. Automating a law enforcement system to achieve perfect enforcement 
says two things, but it says one thing in particular. We don't trust you. We don't trust you to do what's right, and we're going to go ahead and enforce the law automatically, particularly when you engage in preemptive enforcement. And so that risks eroding the necessary trust between the citizens and the governments um, that's critical for any kind of effective governance. Also, there are some moral implications of doing our best to make sure that nobody can violate any crime. Uh, with preemptive enforcement. And so what does it say uh, about a society that takes away all accountability for violations? Like, don't worry, you can do anything you want, because if it was bad for you, we wouldn't let you do it in the first place. Um, and so I think that that's, uh, uh, those are the significant questions that have to be answered in any, in any automated law enforcement scheme. So what can we do about it? Well, first of all, we can ensure that there are procedural safeguards. We can ensure that the basic fundamental due process rights are respected, the rights to notice and a hearing. So we need to know um, when we have violated the law and we need to have an opportunity to be heard. Um, privacy rights. We need uh, better Fourth Amendment jurisprudence. We need to solve the problem of privacy in public, which I think that we're um, headed towards uh, a conflict over that sooner rather than later. We need better electronic surveillance laws. Um, the necessity defense. All of us probably understand that if you're headed to the emergency room, you probably, it's okay to speed. It's fine that if you need to go 75 miles, 80 miles an hour to get to the emergency room that we'll let you pass on this one. There are many instances that you can imagine where we need to go ahead and violate the law because the costs of um, not violating the law are greater. Um, transparency. Who sees the source code? Is it going to be a trade secret or do we all get to see it? And we can look to a lot of the e-voting um, disputes to learn from this, but I think that open, open source and transparency in the code is absolutely critical in any automated law enforcement system. So what can we do about this? Uh, yeah. Obviously, there are, there are countermeasures that are available for all different kinds of problems. Um, we gave, Greg and I gave a talk at the Hope 9 conference uh, last month, or actually earlier this month, about a taxonomy of countermeasure approaches. And you know, in this community, we love to defeat the device. We are all about uh, reverse engineering the firmware and repurposing devices for our own needs. And, and that's great, and that's absolutely a way of providing countermeasures. Um, or man in the middle attacks on the network, or defeat the processing, you know, how, how securely is that database um, recording all our data, and can we, can we tamper with it and make it, make it look different for us? Um, and and those, are, those are fun, and those are um, exciting engineering challenges. But even more important, we, we assert, is the, the countermeasures or, or the influence on the actors, the decision makers, the people who decide to build these systems, to emplace these systems, um, and potentially to regulate these systems. Because if we can prevent a bad system from being emplaced in the first place, prevention, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And, and that takes us out of our comfort zone because those are dealing with real people, not with inanimate objects. But that's a vital task uh, to, in, to engage the media, to engage uh, policymakers, to engage law enforcement officials, uh, to engage the people who design and build and test these systems. Because once the system's in place, the local uh, you know, economy, the local leaders are become addicted, particularly if it's profitable, right. addicted to the, uh, to the, the financial you know, uh, resources that it brings in. And getting it dislodged is going to be far, far more difficult. Yeah, better, better to prevent it than to, than to try and remove it after the fact. Um, and then also, you have to worry about competing sensors. When you have these, these different sensor mechanisms, how are they, how are they calibrated? How, are they, how often are they maintained? How, how regularly are they maintained? Because if you have different sensors that, that detect different things about your activities, which one is right? Um, and then we have to look at really how are these laws written and how would they be algorithmically implemented? This is a graph of data that I took from my 2006 Prius showing vehicle speed over a period of, of about five minutes. 
In this test, I set my cruise control to 42 miles an hour, which is the pink line going straight across the graph. And at the very beginning, I was going a little bit downhill, and you could see the speed rise. And then I went a little bit uphill, and the speed dropped below 42. And then I was on some relatively flat terrain, and yet the speed is still bouncing back and forth. Why is that? Well. Speed is, is inherently an analog quantity. It has an infinite variability. But the computers on board our, our cars are digital systems. So they're doing analog to digital conversion, and inherently there is some quantization error involved. And it turns out that the computer system on board my Prius has a quantization window of about 0.6 miles an hour. So it turns out that that computer will never read exactly 42 miles an hour. It's going to read 41.6, 42.2, 42.8, and so forth. Even though the number that it actually spits out is four decimal places behind, you know, four digits behind the decimal place. So it'd be like 41.6374 miles an hour. And so you think it's really, really accurate, but it's not. Um, and so if you just look at this little graph, if the speed limit was exactly what that red line was, uh, there's about 17 times within three minutes that I violated the speed limit, even though my cruise control was set at the speed limit. So would I get 17 speeding tickets? I hope not. Um, but the law has to take that into account. If, if any one of us was tasked with writing code to enforce the speed limit law, how would you do it? And you know, would you have this kind of level crossing scheme where every time you cross the speed limit on an upward trend, you counted that as a, as a violation? Or would you have some kind of sliding window scheme that said only if the level was crossed for 500 milliseconds or 300 milliseconds would you count that as a violation? If there's three violations within a certain period of time, you know, does that count? Or is that three or is that one? So there's lots of the devils in the details. And, um, and I should add that, that there's no current infrastructure in place in the law to respond to that because, of course, these laws were not written with algorithmic precision in mind. And so, for example, take trespassing. So it, it's, it's a violation of the law to trespass. But if you were tasked with uh, making sure that, for example, if, if a GPS device could, it could probably tell whether you're on someone else's property or not, um, how long do you have to be on the property before it's a trespass? Uh, is it a few seconds? What if you're walking down the boundary and one foot touches over? And how far deep into the property do you have to be before it's a trespass? And there are all of these little decisions that we make as judgment calls all the time using discretion uh, in deciding whether to force the law that then have to be encoded and if you make an error, then all of a sudden you've systematized the error of the law. So that opens up a wide range of research topics. Um, this is an unsolved problem, and we're trying to prevent problems. So the community really has to engage in critical analysis of what are the metrics to decide risk versus benefit. At what point is it worth implementing an automated system? You know, how much benefit do you have to derive versus what kind of cost? And then these systems need to be designed for transparency. They need to be designed for accountability. We submit that they should have manual overrides in them. If a car is going to prevent me from violating the speed limit, well, in theory, that sounds like a great thing. But what if I am running to the emergency room? I'd like to be able to get there quickly. Or how many of you saw the video footage from the Japanese earthquake when there was this huge tsunami wave and there was this little car running down the, or riding down the, the road trying to outrun the tsunami wave? You know, if my car couldn't go past like the 30 miles an hour on that road, ooh, that wouldn't be good. So we want to have manual overrides and, and we want to build in the security systems. Now, you all are going to find the flaws and hopefully you'll tell us, and hopefully you know, we'll be able to do something about it. But we want to be able to build in some minimal level of security. Um, and the thing is, this isn't going to happen overnight. This, is, this sort of problem is, is similar to environmental problems. 
um, you know, a little bit of pollution here and there and there, and then suddenly you wake up one morning and your river's on fire. Uh, you know, it's the same kind of thing here. You, you get a little, a little sensor here, a speed, speed camera there, um, you know, a new computer system in the police department, and then the next thing you know, um, we're living in a police state. Um, so, you know, be careful, be careful what you build. And, um, you know, in summary, these systems can be implemented. There's, there's sensor technology out there right now that, that have the potential to automate a lot of the law enforcement process. And if it's not done well, we could have some really serious unintended consequences. And you all in the audience are in a unique position to help avert these, these catastrophes. Um, if you're interested, and, and the uh, PDF on the slides has, has these has all the uh, references. Um, we've done a, a talk at Hope on, on countermeasures, and we've also uh, written a paper for the We Robot conference that talks about some of this in more detail. And we'd really like to thank uh, John Nelson and Dom Larkin, who are two colleagues that collaborated with us on the We Robot project, who weren't able to, to be here with us today. Um, so. As we said, if you've got questions, uh, we'll be in Q&A room number one. Thank you very much.